Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The topic of this uh, session is how data labeling is driving the development of AI applications. Um, we have here today Alexander Wang, CEO of Scale AI, and um, Jake said is going to be moderating. He's the managing director of Stonebridge Ventures. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The topic of this uh, session is... Great. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Thanks sir, for the feedback. Um, uh, I'm Jake Said, um, Stonebridge Ventures. We have Alex Wang with us and uh, founder, CEO of Scale AI, a company that's raised over 100 million in the AI space. Um, you know, let's start off, Alex. Um, tell us about Scale AI. What was the initial problem you were solving? And uh, what was your motivation to go after the space? Yeah, first of all, uh, really appreciative of the MIT CNC for hosting this event. And, uh, thank Thanks for having us. Um, so, my uh, my own personal journey to to building scale uh, was a bit was a bit meandering. So uh, after I graduated from from high school, I actually came out to Silicon Valley to work as an engineer, um, and I worked at this company called Quora, uh, which was very machine learning focused, uh, and machine learning was a huge part of the the sort of strategy of the company. And I I had experienced very firsthand just how difficult building machine learning and AI products actually was. Um, and I'd, I noticed all of these different things that were that were challenging or difficult or, or time intensive in, in the overall process of, uh, of building AI. Then, then after my time there, I actually, I went back to school. I, was, I went to MIT and I, I, uh, I sort of resolved myself to studying as much uh, on machine learning and AI as possible because I thought it was um, incredibly interesting and, and very potentially impactful technology and, uh, and also build as many side projects as I, as I could. And so in my time, I, I, uh, I was working on, I ended up working on a few side projects. I ended up working on a, uh, a camera inside my fridge that would tell me uh, when to refill my groceries, a camera outside my window that would tell me when there was traffic. And, uh, and in the process of building both of these, these side projects, I, I had this realization that um, like, this is actually going to be uh, a very difficult thing to build, uh, mostly because I just don't have the data I need to actually uh, to actually build these algorithms and build these products, and um, and there was this there was this realization, which was that uh, yeah, certainly there are, there are organizations that have a huge amount of infrastructure for building AI and machine learning, and and those organizations uh, are able to be incredibly innovative when it comes to AI and machine learning, and and people within those organizations are able to be very be very innovative. So these are like the like the the expected players, right? Like the Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, um, those sorts of companies. But uh, it was very clear that that none of the the sort of like level of infrastructure uh, existed to much of the rest of the world. And and so as a college student in my dorm room, uh, it didn't exist, uh, and it doesn't exist for a a small startup that's trying to get started, and it doesn't even really exist for a mid sized company. And and so the realization was that um, hey, like solving solving and infra building infrastructure for AI, A, was very, very important. And then B, the, 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 core, uh, the core nugget that really had got me excited and got me to start scale was the realization that like all these algorithms are very bottlenecked on data. And, uh, and the, the sort of like the most important thing that I could be doing or the most, uh, the most impactful thing I could be doing was helping to empower every organization with the ability to get data for their own machine learning algorithms. And within data, you know, you're you're kind of honed in on data labeling. Um, you know, wh why was that important? Why is it a hard problem? Why couldn't folks solve this themselves? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think one of the things about um, about AI that is that is somewhat unintuitive uh, to people is that I think I think we like to think of AI as this incredibly powerful technology that you sort of um, it's like it's like it's almost like a human. It just learns about the world on its own, and all of a sudden, it can make its own decisions. But the the reality is that right now, um, most machine learning, especially if you want to build machine learning that can perform um, at at very high levels and actually be useful to the world, uh, it actually uh, needs to learn all the concepts from huge amounts of data, and and it's not just raw data. It has to be uh, well labeled, annotated data. In some sense, it has to be. Uh, refine like if it were crude oil uh if, if, if data is new oil right then like you can't just make 
you can't just use crude oil. You have to go through this refinement process. And, and what this ends up looking like is, uh, is, is actually going through all of, all of the data and marking out the patterns that are important or valuable for the, for the algorithm to be able to understand. So for example, uh, for a self-driving car, if, if you wanted to build a self-driving car that won't run into people and therefore can see people around it, um, the, the process ends up being that you have to go through millions and millions of images and mark out in all the images where the people are in all these images and then use this data set to train the algorithms. And so, uh, and so that's, that's kind of the core, this sort of process of going through the images and, and identifying these patterns or going through whatever kind of data and identifying the patterns so that the machine learning can learn from um, is, is really what we do. And, and you mentioned self-driving cars and Scale AI is well known for having it start there. What, what other industries are you tackling today and what industries do you see moving into in the future? Yeah, I think, um, so we, we were, uh, like many startups, I think it's, it's always important that you, uh, you really corner one market first. And it's, at this point, it's somewhat common startup advice. But, um, but we, we got our start in, in autonomous vehicles and self-driving, which was an incredible industry because um, it was, there's an incredible amount of innovation. The people working on, on self-driving technology are um, at the forefront of, of the application of many technologies in AI. Um, and, uh, and, and so we were able to serve some of the most demanding customers in the world. <laughs> and, and so in that process, we built, we built all sorts of technology, um, automation and algorithms and great, uh, great software that allows us to do this process. And we realized that was very useful to a much broader set of industries. So we began working with, uh, sort of, uh, other large technology companies. Um, so work with companies like Pinterest or Airbnb. Um, or DoorDash uh, on a variety of different issues. And, and we started broadening the kind of problems that, um, that frankly, we, uh, we worked on. We, start, we were working on visual search problems, um, but we also worked on, on uh, more visceral problems to, to greater sets of businesses, like the ability to understand documents as a, as a very major problem, or the ability to understand text when many companies are, are sitting on text. And so we've seen oh, like this broad uh, wave of companies that are working to, to integrate AI and machine learning to their businesses, whether that be tech companies like the Pinterest or Airbnb is, or it's more traditional companies like a, a financial services company or a bank or a, uh, uh, or a, a insurance company. Like many, many businesses are, are trying to do and, and use machine learning. And, and you mentioned, um visual data sets, very important, uh, moving into uh, textual data sets. Um, any other data sets that you view as kind of key pillars for, um, you know, data labeling and, and, you know, both today and what you see emerging in the future? Yeah, so, so one of the incredible uh, things that's kind of happened or one of the incredible uh, innovations over the last, say, decade is that all of a sudden we now have from a machine learning perspective, the ability to actually process and understand almost all forms of data that um, that us as humans can understand. So this includes uh, the first frontier was was visual data, right? There was ImageNet was the seminal data set that kind of um, that kind of spurred this uh, a lot of the innovation. Um, and so so naturally, like a lot of the initial applications were were visual in nature, uh, but but then. Then a lot of the technology and techniques were applied to text um, or, and are continuing being applied to text now. We work closely with organizations like OpenAI who are really innovating in their ability to, to, uh, to do machine learning on text. It's actually really incredible. Um, and, then, uh, uh, and then all sorts of other kinds of data types. So uh, audio has been a, uh, a very interesting area because, um, well, first, uh, all of us are talking on Zoom right now. So there's like all of a sudden there's way more audited in the world uh, than before. But but in addition to that, like the uh, the virtual assistants like Alexa and Siri and, and all these companies really use for deep learning and for machine learning in, in a really incredible way. And, and so that that is like uh, so images, text, audio. And then we've had to work with all sorts of different sensors because it turns out that 
um, people are really enterprising with how to apply machine learning. So we work with uh, LiDAR data, this 3D, we work with videos um, that are uh, like all sorts of video data. We work with videos where like there's multi video arrays. And so like you have all these sorts of videos that are all pointed at the same thing and trying to understand what that object looks like in 3D. Um, we've had to work with lots of documents. I think uh, there's one of our offering scale document serves uh, all sorts of businesses that are trying to revolutionize their, their ability to process documents, um, which is one of these problems that like the AI uh, community has uh, for many, many years sort of viewed as solved. And uh, it turns out that like uh, there's a, there's a significant portion that needs to be handled by humans. And so there, there's, there's, um, there's a really broad and incredible set of, of different kinds of data that not only we support, but also that we're seeing many people innovate on, uh, which is, is very exciting. And, and, you know, it's interesting with, with data oriented companies, data oriented startups, you always hear about the, the network effect opportunities for those types of business models, the more data they get better their product or services to customers. So they're able to get more customers. So they get more data. So they have a better product, but in your business, I would expect that a, a lot of the data is very proprietary. They don't want their data and, and, and the labeling of that data to benefit, you know, the other customer down the street. Is this a network effect business model? Um, and, and if so, how, given the proprietary nature of the data? Yeah, so this is a, this is a great question. And, and so we work with many, many of our customers where we, uh, where you're exactly right. A lot of their data is very proprietary and they wouldn't want it, want it to be used for any other purpose other than to serve them. And, um, and so there's, there's naturally uh, system, like there's naturally this tension where we, um, we protect their data and that's, that's the service that we offer to these customers. One of the things that, that we've noticed as we've built scale is that um, there's actually a huge amount of automation built into the labeling process, some of which are data intensive, some of which aren't data intensive. Um, and uh, and the, the sort of process of continually improving our overall process, our, our overall labeling process by adding more automation, making it more and more automated, uh, by uh, finding ways to better utilize humans in the loop and, and better utilize humans and their insights in the actual labeling process has been, uh, has frankly been really critical. And so, um, We've we've noticed in uh, sort of one of the one of the indications right of a strong business is that um, you are able to uh, you're able to consistently make your product better and better and better, and we've noticed historically and and consistently that um, Scale's offering gets better and better and better. It's a very it's a very like uh, Amazon style thinking, <laughs> which is that. Um, which is that it is our job to serve the relentlessly unhappy customer. Uh, and, and we view that as our role. And, and so we view that as how we will consistently build uh, greater and greater advantages in our business. And let me start going into some audience questions. Um, you know, one is related to how do you convince companies to outsource data labeling, but let me expand on that <clears throat> where, you know, um, in, in addition to convincing them, I would expect that you know, there's a, a strong benefit in data labeling for uh, industry expertise, domain knowledge, and if you couple that with you know the sensitivity around the data and how strategic um, the, the label data is, um, you know, could there be a trend for this to be pulled more and more in-house? And, and if not, why not? Yeah, I I think the um, the overwhelming pattern throughout. Uh, the history of technology is one that is in favor of the platforms. Um, for uh, it's for very simple economic reasons, but it turns out that like platforms are economically significantly more efficient than uh, than everybody trying to do their own thing. And and so there, there's recent examples of this which are really interesting. Um, there's sort of uh, there's AWS and Stripe. Uh, and Twilio, like all incredible recent examples. And I think, I think a lot of the same arguments would apply. Like I think AWS is an interesting example. Why would you run your code on, on somebody else's servers, especially a company with 
a uh, a history for being relentlessly competitive. Um, uh, why would you be willing to do that? Why would you be willing to have no like technology? Sorry, I get the your internet connection is unstable, so hopefully everything is still working. Um, uh, how like and, and so I think that the same arguments of sort of of uh, hey, this is my secret sauce, this is my like a protectionist argument apply to all these platforms that existed in the past. And um, it turns out there's like, there's a strong economic force, which is that platforms end up being significantly more efficient for the whole industry. And this, this plays out time and time again, even before obviously these more contemporary tech uh, examples. In the past, um, if you look at the automotive industry, which is an industry that we work very closely with, uh, everybody used to build all their own parts and build all their own technology. And then uh, the, the clear economic win for all the organizations was uh, was building out tier one suppliers like Bosch and ZF and, and these other organizations that would then uh, build out these components that weren't necessarily critical to the to the actual performance of technology um, and uh, and build them out for everybody in a very scalable way. And so I think I think um, a lot of the a lot of the thinking around AI. We I think a lot of times we view AI. We think about AI very differently from how we think about traditional software. Um, in that I think we think of AI as this like coveted technology with all these competitive dynamics and, 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 um, and something that's very unique. But, but in actuality, many of the dynamics are actually very similar to tra traditional software, where the overwhelming trend over the past few decades is that um, companies have more and more platforms to build on top of. They have AWS, they have Stripe, they have uh, Twilio, they have uh, Datadog, they have um, uh, you, you name it, there's an API for the thing. And, uh, and that, that trend has allowed many more businesses on the whole to be started in a much more economically um, uh, efficient way. And so, and so we believe, we believe that that's sort of our crusade or that's our, that's our journey for AI is how do, we, how do we do the same thing for AI and building out all this infrastructure that allow significantly more organizations to actually do machine learning in the real world um, and actually be able to get to a point where they have products that are able to scale and able to, to work in the real world. Let me take another one from the audience. Um, how much of labeling work is done automatically versus manually? And, and again, let me um, expand on that, which is, you know, you also have emerging techniques, uh, one shot uh, learning models, zero shot uh, methodologies, um, you know, that, that potentially, you know, dramatically reduce the amount of manual labor needed um, so within your own business, how much is automated versus manual? And then what impact do some of these emerging approaches have on your business model? Yeah, so we view, uh, we view the, the humans as incredibly critical <laughs> to the performance of the system, right? And so at the core, right, there's... Um, I think we like to think of, or there's sort of this like uh, dystopian future where where these uh, algorithms all learn things on their own, and there's sort of there's no human intervention. But the the reality today is that uh, algorithms uh, make all sorts of strange mistakes, and they require humans to be able to resolve all of those mistakes. And so we really, I, I think I think the whole world would be in a much worse state if we viewed um, if if we didn't involve humans as much as possible, smart, intelligent uh, humans in the process of building AI so that we actually ensure that it has the results that we want to. And, and I think to your point with respect to zero shot or one shot learning techniques, I think the the reality is that, so, so there's a lot of incredible research here and it's very interesting as, as a whole field, but the, the challenge is, is um, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like traditional software uh, and there's a there's a very good parallel where where sort of there's this parallel in, in traditional software which is like with the proliferation of of open source technology um maybe all of a sudden you don't actually uh you don't actually need uh engineers or you don't need very many engineers to actually build incredible products um on the internet uh but the but the actual thing that ends up happening is it turns out it really really is impactful to build products that serve your customers incredibly, incredibly well, and you build features that are very tailor-made for your customers and end up making a big impact. And 
you have all sorts of bespoke problems that come up in your business that you need to build things to solve. And I think the same thing is true on the, on the machine learning side, which is certainly there's this trend where many very generic uh, algorithms or problems will be built into platforms in the same way that I, um, if you want an algorithm that can detect uh, cats or, or <laughs> to detect a cat in an image, that's something that is going to exist as a utility to the broad uh, to the broader world, just in the same way that um, React exists as open source technology to to everybody uh, who wants to build uh, web technologies. Um, but at the same time, humans are incredibly innovative, and and companies are incredibly innovative, and developers are incredibly innovative, and they're con going to continue building more and more intensive applications and more and more products like or companies and products like self driving technology, which will require uh, huge amounts of volumes of data to build technology that can actually solve all the problems that we need. And so I think there's kind of this, um, I, I for one am always on the side of, of efficiency and always on the side of, of sort of the march of technological progress. And I think that's incredibly important, but I think the reality is that like AI is a fragile technology. Um, that's kind of the reality. And I think we, we see instances of that everywhere. And the only way in which you can make, uh, like AI and machine learning more robust is by embracing the reality that like it needs more information. It needs more data in the real world. You know, we've kind of been um, going down the rabbit hole of, of um, you know, data labeling. Let's, let's zoom back out now and really, you know, you're a leader in the field of AI and maybe if you could speak generally about, you know, what you see on the horizon, you know, what, what new and exciting innovations are out there. I'm sure the audience would love to hear your perspective. Yeah, I think the um, so I, I think there's there's a few things that are that are really incredible. I think the first is um, is the mastery of language, which uh, OpenAI's uh, GPT three uh, is an incredible innovation, and uh, it seems to be the case that that um, we will like we will be able to build algorithms that understand language incredibly, incredibly deeply and incredibly well. And that is, this is very impactful. I mean, humans communicate via language, humans communicate um, in this like very coded way that happens to be very efficient and, and uh, can encode very deep concepts. And, and I think the, the mastery of, of language is an incredible feat. And I think we're going to see a lot more there over the coming, uh, over the next few, next many years, right? At the same time, I think the, from, from a sort of, um, from a practical perspective or a more pragmatic perspective, the thing that is uh, incredibly exciting is that I think um, while uh, while this has been said for many, many years in the past, that we're sort of on the cusp of, of like a practical AI revolution or an, a revolution of AI applications, um, I think we're actually, we're actually getting very close to that. And I think we're actually seeing that where sort of the first wave was self-driving technology. And there's another wave around um, using machine learning and AI to solve medical problems. And I think I think we're we're going to like I think these problems that where AI can be incredibly impactful are going to continue to be knocked down one by one because all of a sudden there's a lot of people who are excited to build AI in the real world. They're very passionate about it. Um, they're going to build incredible companies, incredible products to solve all these problems. And uh, and then through organizations like us and many other organizations like the giant cloud, like the cloud companies, um, all of a sudden you, there's there exist platforms that you can actually build on top of. And uh, and get quite far with just being yourself in a in a in a dorm room. And so I, I think from a from an overall like level of potential perspective, like um, the the sort of the democratization of AI technology is really happening, and it, it is going to have a lot of impact for a while. That's great, um, and I think that's a great uh, point to end on. You know, we're on the cusp of really letting a thousand flowers bloom, as they say. And, um, you know, the, you know, the innovation that'll come from that is it's not going to be linear. It's going to be nonlinear, like so many other things that we saw, you know, so many other platforms, whether it was the internet or, you know, uh, smartphone, iPhone, um, lots of innovation came about that no one could have predicted. And it seems like that's where we're getting to in AI. Um, well, um, I want to be mindful of our time. We've come to the end of our session. And uh, thank you, Alex, for the great chat. And I'll turn it over to Richta.
Thank you so much, Alex and Jake. Really appreciated um, the conversation and your insights. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Please be sure to log off and log back in for our next session um, later today on predicting and aligning and preventing place-based um, child welfare. Look forward to seeing you soon.